keynote speaker for today's session. In the morning, we'll start uh, within five minutes from now. So those who are still lingering at the lobby or the main floor, uh, please resume to the conference room. Thank you.
A very good morning. Welcome to the second day of the 8 uh, TCU International E-Learning Conference 2017. Um, I think uh, our uh, keynote speakers for today's sessions are very interesting in terms of their presentation. I would like to kick off by the first keynote speaker. Uh, he is the founder and the CEO of Class Central, the most popular search engine and review site for MOOCs. His life changed when he got accepted into the Master's in Computer Science program at Georgia Tech. For the first time, he's discovered that quality education is life-changing. So when free online courses from top universities uh, started popping up, uh, he got excited and also built a one-page site to aggregate all these courses. The site was called Class Central, which is now the leading destination for finding MOOCs, as well as understanding what is happening in the world of MOOCs. With a simple interface and tens of thousands of reviews, Class Central has helped 10 million people decide which online course to take next. He has completed over a dozen MOOCs and uh, has written over 200 articles about MOOCs space, including contributions to um, TechCrunch, its search, venture beat course, and uh, a tech review. And, uh, his presentation is entitled The Evolution, Evolution of MOOC Space in the Last Five Years. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Doha Shah. Good morning, everyone. Hello, so my name is Dhawal, and for the last five years, I've done a number of online courses, and I also had the opportunity of watching the MOOC space evolve closely. Just technical issues. I'm going to share this journey that I went through. Uh, I'll try to, and my focus will mostly be on US or in, uh, MOOC providers, but I'll also elaborate on uh, international MOOC providers at the end. Uh, and my goal here is to first uh, convey the hype that the MOOCs went through in the very first year of their establishment, and also what are the changes that have occurred since then. So the word MOOCs itself is more of a marketing term. Many people use it differently. Uh, there's no fixed definition. It was first coined back in 2008 uh, when a couple of uh, instructors did an experiment, uh, but it didn't catch on. Uh, but in 2011 and 2012, when uh, Stanford started offering free online courses. The media brought back this term and started applying to the space. And here's how we define MOOCs in, at Class Central. Uh, usually these are free online courses taught by universities. Uh, they also have an element of feedback, like quizzes, assignments, homeworks. Uh, many of them have forums, so peers can interact with each other. Uh, a lot of these, uh, these things have changed in the last five years, and I'll elaborate on uh, these changes as we go through the talk. 
And uh, just to set the baseline, uh, at the end of 2016, uh, we were at 58 million students who had taken at least one MOOC and more than 700 universities that had created online courses. Uh, this is based, these numbers are based on an analysis that I do at the end of every year. And I, since I published these numbers, uh, these numbers are into mid-2017 have definitely gone up. Uh, and at Class Central, we aggregate MOOCs from all over the world. Uh, we categorize them into, uh, based on the uh, subjects. And then it all, uh, it's a searchable directory of MOOCs. Uh, we also have tens of thousands of reviews. So it helps you decide if a co course is right for you. I founded Class Central back in 2011. And since then, we have helped more than 10 million people decide uh, which online course to take. Beyond just a directory, we also publish a lot of news and analysis of the MOOC space. And we have published over 500 articles on our blog, MOOC Report. Uh, I myself have published articles on a number of different uh, publications. So, so let me start with the origin story. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is I'll point to specific events that happened in the first year of the MOOC. And, and my goal here is to convey the hype that occurred and why it occurred. So let's get started. So it all began when almost six years to this day the, uh, when a, a couple of Stanford professors announced a free online course on artificial intelligence. Uh, Sebastian Thrun was one of these professors. Previously, he was head of Google X and also led Google's self-driving car effort. And within a month of announcing, o over 58,000 people signed up for this, his course. And all this happened without any marketing purely word of mouth, and they also got featured in New York Times. And at the same time, another group of Stanford professors, this time led by Andrew Wing and Sebastian, uh, Andrew Wing and Daphne Kohler, announced two more free online courses. Uh, one course was taught by Andrew Wing himself, it was in machine learning, and the other one was taught by uh, Jennifer Windham, it was Introduction to Database. And on October 10, 2011, these three courses went live. Even though at this point nobody was calling them MOOCs yet, they were just Stanford free online courses. According to me, like, I consider this as the birth date of the MOOC revolution. And I and almost 100,000 students, or more than 100,000 students, signed up for all, all these three courses. I actually was one of them. I had signed up for Sebastian Thrun's artificial intelligence class. And while these courses were going on, Stanford kept announcing a few more courses. Uh, and one of the, and each course has a different site. So one of the problems was. If you wanted to know the start date, you had to click through so many different sites to figure, uh, figure out what the start dates are and when can you take which course. So what I did was I just built a one-page site which listed all these courses on, on one page in a single table that you could start, sort by start date. And so that's how Class Central was launched. I just launched it over the weekend and in December, uh, and in December, MIT also decided to join the game. They announced MIT X, uh, a platform where they will offer free online courses. And the platform behind MIT where X was also supposed to be open sourced. And meanwhile, I got my certificate in artificial intelligence. Uh, at this time, I didn't have to pay for it, but in 2017, unfortunately, you have to pay if you want to get a certificate. 
And in January, it's when things started moving really fast. Uh, I discovered on the Stanford, like the and the course pages of Stanford, suddenly started showing the name Coursera, and that's how Coursera was born. Uh, this was the first uh, homepage of Coursera, and as you can see on the top in the mission statement, they mentioned that their mission is to provide free online courses to everyone in the world. Unfortunately, that's not their mission statement now. And this Coursera was formed by the second group of uh, Stanford professors uh, that announced the ML and DB class. Uh, it was started by Andrew Ng and Daphne Kohler. And their courses had already, this is still January, and their courses had already had gathered hundreds of, th tens of thousands of registration. The, the smallest course that had registration was probabilistic graphical models. Uh, it had only 35,000 registrations, and it's a very difficult course and taught by uh, Daphne Kohler, who co-founded Coursera. And meanwhile, the first group uh, behind the artificial intelligence class, they announced a new platform called Udacity with two new courses. Uh, one was CS101, and uh, the other one was programming a robotic car that was self-driving robotic car by Sebastian Thrun. And at the end of January, I stumbled upon a job post by Coursera, which revealed that they're going to be a for-profit company. It's, uh, at that point, it was a bit surprising, because many of us thought that Coursera is going to be part of Stanford as a non-profit organization. Even two days before I found the job post, in an interview, one of the co-founders mentioned that they're not sure if Coursera should be a for-profit or non-profit. So things, things were moving really fast back then. And in February, Udacity went live with their first two courses. I still remember the day it went live. I was, uh, the day it was supposed to launch. I kept refreshing their page. And as soon as it launched, I went around and started playing with the site, with the interface. And apparently, I became the first person to ever complete a programming quiz on Udacity. Uh, this is the email I received from the professor who was teaching the CS101 course. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and not to be outdone, oops. Screensaver. Yes, uh, not to be outdone, I too launched a new design for Class Central. Uh, nobody really cared, but I did launch it. And uh, at this time, it was just a hobby for me. I used to spend uh, nights and weekends trying to see what's happening and keep track of all these courses. And then in March, uh, MITx goes live. Uh, they, they went live with a course called Circuits and Electronics. Uh, it was taught by a professor named Anant Agrawal, who later on became the CEO of edX. Uh, one of the interesting features of this, uh, this platform was you could draw a circuit in the browser itself for one of the assignments. Um, they also had, you could also access, Anant had a textbook which cost like more than 100 bucks. You could access that textbook inside the platform for free. Uh, I was hoping this was one of the features would, that would catch on, but unfortunately, it didn't. And then in April, Coursera raised $18 million, uh, $16 million, and announced 20 more courses. Uh, Harvard and MIT soon followed up. 
they announced an initiative called edX, which was based on MITx. And they put in $60 million to fund uh, edX. And the platform behind edX, similar to MITx, was going to be open source. Uh, it is called edX now, and that's, how, that's what Thai MOOC uses for its, and many other international providers, for its uh, platform to host courses. Then in August, Coursera announced that uh, they crossed one million users. And at that time, Coursera liked to brag uh, that they reached their first million users faster than Facebook reached their first million users. Uh, it was quite an achievement back then, but the growth hasn't been the same since then. And then in September, uh, Coursera announced uh, 17 new university partners uh, we are still in the first year, so, and this takes the university partners to 33 universities with almost 200 courses announced. And in, finally, in October, Udacity announces, announced that they raised another $15 million. Uh, they had raised a $6 million round before, which they didn't announce. And basically, that's how the first year of MOOC ended. Uh, you had announcements after announcement every month. And in within a year, you, like we went from just one university offering three courses to 40 universities offering, uh, having announced more than 250 courses. Uh, the New York Times started calling this as the, uh, as the year of the MOOC, a term that nobody had heard of until even a few months ago. And the media played a major role in creating this hype. They constantly, throughout the period, they constantly wrote articles that basically pronounced the end of universities, disruption of higher education. And what this did was it created a FOMO, fear of missing out, uh, both in uh, higher education as well as uh, Silicon Valley. And both these uh, two groups invested huge amounts of resources and capital without having a plan to uh, how to get a uh, return of their investments. Uh, five years later, we now know that universities are not going to be disrupted by MOOCs. Uh, but in that period, MOOCs have gone uh, rapidly. Uh, this is a graph that the Economist published uh, early this year in an issue on lifelong learning. Uh, it is based on the data that we provided them. And as you can see, uh, the red line, uh, the red, uh, it represents the growth of courses, while the blue vertical bar represents the go growth in number of students. So both these numbers have grown rapidly over the last five years. And as MOOC providers have focused on monetization, they have started offering more and more courses in business and technology. And this is how the landscape for the top five MOOC providers look like. edX, uh, Coursera, edX, and uh, Udacity were formed in the first year of the MOOC space, and they have been in the top five since then. Uh, Xutang X is a MOOC provider based out of China. It started maybe a couple of years after all these providers, or maybe in three years, and it's catching up quickly. I predict they will cross edX in the next couple of years, maybe even faster. And FutureLearn is a UK-based MOOC provider uh, that is a wholly owned subsidiary of Open University. Uh, they're also been growing rapidly. And, and if you want to learn more, like I won't, don't want to bore you with too many numbers. I, I want to move on the top five MOOC trends. And, but if you want to learn more about this, I, you can read it in my end of the year article. Just search for MOOC stats and, on Google and it should be somewhere near the top. Uh, now let's lo uh, let, let me uh, capture like where we are now in terms of trends and how MOOCs have evolved in the last five years. So when MOOCs started, everything was free. The videos, certificates, assignments. Uh, but unfortunately, that is not true. 
as MOOC providers started focusing on monetization, the the portions of the course uh, uh, that were uh, that are free have constantly shrunk. The policies sort of vary from provider to provider, but every provider has made a change to restrict access to l limit access to MOOCs. The first the first thing to go was the free certificate. Uh, in the first year, uh, the certificates were free, and then MOOC providers added another level of a certificate called the verified certificate. And the idea was, if you pay as a student, they will verify your identity and attach it to the certificate. Unfortunately, it was not enough to get people to pay, and people were just happy with the free certificate. So they had to remove the free certificate, and the verified certificate just became the new certificate. Uh, the other big change that Coursera made early this year is uh, they put up the uh, graded assignments, homeworks, and quizzes behind a paywall. Unless you pay for the certificate, you won't be able to access uh, the graded assignments. And it caused a lot of controversy and a lot of long blog posts from students who were not happy with the change. Uh, but it didn't matter, and Coursera went ahead with it. Um, then another MOOC provider, FutureLearn, also followed up with the similar changes. And now all the MOOC providers have are offering completely paid courses on their platforms. Sometimes it's not easy to figure out which courses are completely paid, but all of them have plans have or have announced courses that are completely paid. Usually these can range from low tens of dollars to even single digit thousand dollars. Uh, I think Coursera has a course which is here from Rice University which is a couple of thousand dollars or more. So, And at some point that course was actually free, but they now changed it to paid. And the second trend is the change in how the MOOCs are scheduled. Originally, MOOCs were session-based. Uh, what that means, it had a start date, end date, and also hard deadlines for assignments. But there were a number of issues with session-based courses. Uh, they were only offered once or twice a year, and it, you had to rely, it, it, they had to rely on the professor's availability and schedule uh, for it to run. So as a student, it was kind of frustrating to find a course that you want to take, only to realize that the course ended a like a few months ago, or it will start in a few months. Uh, from the provider's perspective, it was also inconvenient to monetize if the courses just ran uh, a few months a year. So, so they made a switch to, to uh, basically courses are now available throughout the year. Uh, you can just, uh, most of the courses now, uh, once they start, are always open to enroll. The assignments are soft deadlines. They're not hard deadlines anymore. And in case of Coursera, what they have done is they do have start dates, but these are just guidelines. And courses are now automatically started every two weeks or a month. So in case you cannot catch up to the current session, you can move, move your progress to the next session. So it's, it's very convenient for the students. Uh, uh, we did a quick poll on our Twitter account, and a majority of the students uh, preferred session-based courses over self-based courses. And, and the data from uh, the providers uh, agree. This is a quote from Ajay, who is the CEO of Cadenze, a, a MOOC platform optimized for arts education. Uh, in early 2016, they made a similar change, and they got more assignment submissions in one month than the entirety of 2015. So in some ways, switching the schedule switch is a, something that both providers as well as students want.
but uh, the change, uh, the, this change in curve schedule has caused MOOCs to be no longer massive. This is a screenshot of forums uh, that I took last year when I was doing a machine learning course on Coursera. Um, you might not be able to see it, but there's just been one post in the last four days. And before that, there's probably a post a day. So the forum acti activity has drastically reduced. At one time, Coursera used to boast that it took them tw it took 22 minutes for a f question on forum to get a reply back. Now, you now it's just crickets. And this is ba basically caused due to the schedule changes. Before, uh, MOOC pro before all the students were collected in, and started together in one or two sessions a year. Now they are moving to in small cohorts because now you can start as soon as possible, and this has led to a drastic redu reduction in forum activity. The other big trend has been MOOC providers' effort around crea creating some kind of tangible uh, show way to for you to earn credit or credential or degrees. Over the years, there has been many, there have been many efforts to allow students to earn credits on the base of, for MOOCs, uh, but they haven't really caught on. Uh, this is the announcement that you see here is from Arizona State University and edX, where they launched uh, the Global Freshman Academy, which basically allowed uh, students to earn credits online for their first year of uh, undergrad. And I'm not, I don't think I've heard anything positive about like students adopting this. Uh, the other problem, at least in the US, is it's not easy to understand if the credits are transferable or not. So I think that further hampers the adoption. But the big investment MOOC providers have made in, is in MOOC-based credentials. These are usually a sequence of courses that learners have to take to earn a certificate. And they're more bigger than a course and smaller than an, a, a degree. Some people call it micro-credentials. Um, and they're generally focused in high demand skills and technology and business. Uh, each provider has a unique name for their own credential. You'd, as Coursera calls themselves specialization. Udacity calls them nano degree. And in case of edX, they have three different credentials. Um, it, it causes confusion, to, confusion in terms of student because these names are still very early stages and it's not clear from the names what they actually entail. So um, it's good from the MOOC providers, they're trying to brand themselves and own that the next big term. But from a student's per perspective, they're all, it causes additional confusion. I'm not sure even employers understand what these credentials are. The one interesting credential that I would like to highlight is edX MicroMasters. So if you earn a MicroMasters credential, uh, then you can actually apply to the university that created that credential for the master's program. And if you get accepted, uh, they waive off one semester worth of credits. So what this means is uh, it reduces for the learners, it reduces the cost of a master's degree as well as the time. But even if you don't really you take the credit, uh, I think it's a good signal to the employers that if the universities are willing to accept their own courses at credit, uh, then it means that it's, it's a more rigorous credentials as opposed to other credentials which are not backed by any other, like a real world currency. But the most expensive product that MOOC providers can offer is a completely online master's degree. Uh, almost four years ago, Georgia Tech was the first one to announce, along with Udacity, an online master's in computer science. And if you get that degree, on the degree certificate, it doesn't say whether it's an online degree or not. I actually have a master's from Georgia Tech in computer science, and I paid 60000 for that privilege. 
this degree costs less than seven thousand dollars and since it's been a long time we have some numbers uh, more than 4,500 students are enrolled in the degree right now but only 300 have graduated uh, it on, it's only because most of them are taking an in uh, part-time and have a full-time job so they take a they take significantly longer to graduate as opposed to on-campus student and all the MOOC providers have shown their intent on launching more online degrees. Um, if things go according to plan, uh, we might see almost 100 post-grad and master's degree by 2020. It's, it's just easier to monetize the online degree as, as opposed to free online courses, so it makes sense to move in that direction. Uh, this is just a landscape uh, of the major MOOC providers, and you can see everybody's kind of doing everything, maybe except Udacity with the college credit. And the final t big trend is like MOOCs have found their audience. The original narrative of, for MOOCs were they were targeted towards people, they were supposed to be a replacement for a university education. But now, five years on, uh, providers have found that uh, the real audience for MOOCs are adult learners, people who are generally have a degree and are well beyond their college years. Uh, they generally do these courses not for, uh, for they do these courses uh, primarily for career growth. According to Coursera, 89% uh, of their uh, learners are above the age of 22. So it sends a very strong signal on who, who takes these courses. And the way uh, MOOC providers are targeting these uh, professional learners is uh, this through three different ways. One, the first one is the certificate programs, uh, like specialization, nano degrees, micro masters. The second is through online degrees. And the last one is through corporate learning. So instead of reaching directly to the learners, uh, they go to their employers and get them to pay for these certificates. Usually these are multi-year contracts, uh, multi-year contracts and can be of significant dollar value. It's still early stages, but Coursera claims to have 50 companies that have uh, joined their corporate learning program. Uh, the corporate learning market is significantly bigger than the business to consumer market that the MOOCs started out in. So this is another direction I expect MOOC providers to heavily invest in. And finally, I would like to uh, paint a picture of the landscape of MOOC providers and how I see things. In my view, the MOOC providers are distributed in two major categories, global and regional. The global ones are usually the ones with partner with um, number of universities around the world. Uh, they've generally focused on adult learners through, d and they sometimes also partner with tech companies like Microsoft has 100 plus courses uh, on edX and they, Google, Edda, sorry, Coursera also has a partnership with Google. Uh, so, and they will target these adult learners through certificate programs, online degrees, and corporate training. Uh, they have a very strong focus on monetization, uh, and generally their focus is also on high demand tech skills and maybe your business skills like data science, digital marketing. Regional MOOC providers, on the other hand, are generally focused on uh, a certain geography or a country. Uh, in, and in, they, they start out looking like global uh, MOOC providers, wherein they partner with universities in their country and launch courses. Uh, but they, they, can, they have another role in which they can focus, improve the quality of education in their country quality of, and access of higher education in their country. And 
Since many of them are backed by the government, they have the potential to legislate, launch legislation that allows hybrid or blended learning programs uh, to that uh, help learn students earn credits, students in the current education system to earn credits that count uh, towards their degrees. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples on uh, two providers that have made uh, progress in that in that area. So the first one is Swayam. It's India's official MOOC platform. Uh, it's it partners with the top universities in India and has launched a number of online courses. But the government of India also released a legislation last year that allows students to earn uh, credits through Swayam. So this is how it works. An institution, a, a higher education institution in India can, uh, can curate 20% of their catalog uh, from Swayam then the students can enroll in these courses. And if they don't have the resources, uh, like computer or internet access, the, their parent institution has to provide them with the infrastructure. At the end of the, course, at the, end of the semester, uh, they have to give a proctored exam at an institution, at their parent institution or somewhere nearby. And they will, earn, they will be able to get recognition for that course they did online. So, so yeah, even if you're in like a, a small town, you can get a credit from the best institu institution in India. So the legislation is pretty impressive, but Swayam has faced issues on execution and logistics. Uh, they started on this journey more than three years ago. It's still not completely live. Um, instead of choosing open edX, uh, they went with trying to build their own platform and unfortunately hired Microsoft India to build it. Uh, I tried the first version and it wasn't impressive. Uh, the other one is uh, Zhutang X. Uh, what they have done is they have launched a product called Cloud LMS, which universities in China can use to offer Zhutang X courses to their students. and. It also allows, if, if a professor wants, they can create their own MOOC courses for their students. Um, maybe it's no coincidence that the two largest countries by population have moved ahead to take this step. Uh, but we are almost here at the end. But in general, regional MOOC providers have the potential to target problems that are very local to their countries. Uh, while global MOOC providers will focus more on uh, monetization or things that are at a global scale, they will take, they will focus on maybe technology and business, but might not focus on skills that are a certain country might require. Uh, they want to focus on things that make them a lot more money. And uh, my my concern is that the global MOOC providers might go further down the path of paid, and the free that is currently now will further shrink. So the true vision of MOOCs, uh, access to quality education for free, now lies in the hands of regional MOOC providers like Thai MOOC or K MOOC. Um, so, so yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can just reach out to me via email. Uh, we still have like five minutes for uh, any questions from the audience, if you please. I guess I was very clear. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, wow. Thank you so much for your 
very insightful information. Now I see clearly the history of MOOCs. I have one question, please. As you know, Thai MOOC at the moment, we are built on government initiative. Everything is free for enrollment. Um, sooner or later, we will need to survive. <laughs> Business model may have to come in. Based on your experience, uh, what do you think would be a good way for Thai MOOC to look at in terms of sustainability? How can we survive, let's say, 10 years from now? How, how can we survive? Uh, can you share your thought on this, please? Thank you. Um, sure. At this moment, I'm not sure if there's any regional MOOC provider that does an excellent job at monetization. Uh, the ones that do a better job at monetization, even Open edX or edX doesn't do a good job of monetization. It's generally Coursera, Udacity, which have Silicon Valley money and they're laser focused on monetization. So it's, I, I'm an analyst, so I only look at patterns and can answer the question. Um, but I think if you look at uh, Jutang X, they basically license that LMS you know, to the local university. So getting universities to sort of, or the edX model too, where universities pay a subscription fee, and that's how edX has sustained. And once you have a better catalog, like certification can, you know, if you tie that certification with direct uh, job outcomes and it gets recognized uh, in the low, in Thailand, so it might be a stronger, it, it might be a good way to monetize that. So I, I don't know if there's a single strategy. And as I've seen, they have tried, they, they, they try everything and s some of it works, some of it doesn't work. So I think you'll have to go down that road to trying multiple different business models to see what works for Thai MOOC. Thank you so very much. Any more questions? Yes, please. You can come up to the microphone over there. I just hello. Okay, I just have a quick question because traveling uh, to online educa in Berlin and OLC in the states, uh, everybody's talking about the death of the MOOC. So, what is your point and take on this right now? I mean, as like MOOCs were hyped, the death of MOOCs is also hyped. I think as a student, it's the MOOC space has generally grown, but it's the media attention that has grown and waned. Um, it's still strong. Uh, we get like 400,000 people a month looking for MOOCs, and we are one of the smallest players. Uh, I think from from a student perspective, they're looking for something like a free online education. They're looking for something strong. Uh, but from a provider perspective, uh, they want to monetize. And if the MOOC vision sort of dies, it's because providers are moving away from, they're changing their monetization strategy. It's not because of the demand. Right. Just a quick question because uh, learning from all these different conferences that uh, supposedly the MOOC is dying. Uh, as a student perspective, I agree with you that students are still looking for free online, but uh, as a perspective of graduation or actually finishing the courses, most providers are saying basically if the student pays for it, they are more determined to finish the course. Because I saw you, I, if you look at uh, some of your stats, you know, uh, 27 million, how many people actually fish, finishing? And uh, as you show with Georgia Tech, I mean, out of that, only 300 students have actually finished. You think that is actually a drive for students to finish more as a monetary fund? I, I think paying just shows a stronger intention of you wanting it. Okay. I don't think it just paying money causes you to finish it. I think it's just... I think completion rate are probably linearly connected to the how much you pay, because if I'm paying, I kind of have recognized the value of this course. Uh, when you sign up for a free course, you're just still playing around. So I, it's, it's a convenient uh, way for book providers to say that, that paying helps people complete it just because it's their best interest to do that. But for me, I think it's just, Paying means that you have bought into the, you're convinced that you need this course and you're convinced the value that course will provide you. Okay. 
So it's just because that's why. It, the one thing I would want to look at, which we can't look at, is like, yes, students who pay complete more courses, but are these the same 10% that would have finished anyways? Or are these a different population that, you know, from the outside of the 10% that because of paying they have finished? So, you know, that's unfortunately, they won't yes. tell us. Oh, yeah, true. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the exchange of points of views. Thank you. So we are going to take a short break for 15 minutes and the second presentation will commence at half past 10. Thank you.